pros of going to jail. Jail is warm, I assume. I don't actually know, but I figure they must have heating in there. Honey won't pay for heating at the moon because it's an unnecessary expense. So like, I'd for sure be warmer after I got arrested. Another pro was like, networking. I probably wouldn't make friends, but I'd definitely meet people. And maybe one of them is a roof fixer, and one day we both get out, and I need my roof fixed, and he comes and does it for free, because we're tight. Also, I'll probably get treated well because I'm white. I may not even get arrested because I'm white. Maybe not a pro. Maybe just privilege. Cons. Probably we'll have to go to a woman's prison, since there's no such thing as a non-binary jail. Don't think prison guards will use my pronouns. Con. Just realize that I'd like be a con and I'm listing cons. Con. If I make puns, I'll probably get stabbed. Pro. I can work towards inmate rights and fight for those who have been wrongly or disproportionately incarcerated. Con. That's much easier to do when I'm not in jail. Then again, it's only political espionage. Maybe I'll be fine. says he needs to tell me something. We meet up in Kensington Market for coffee, which he says is totally fine to do in public since anyone who would recognize him only hangs out around Yorkville. His face is flushed pink like the sun said something to make him blush. We have to talk about this book, he says seriously. The dad is just way too cool to be realistic. He's unbelievably chill. He's like Danny's best friend. Oh, oh my God, my God, the raisins. We need to talk about the sleeping pill powder and the raisins. It's insane. It's just so insane. Can we test it? Do you want to test it just to see? Where are we going to find pheasants? I ask. Okay, okay, okay. Hear me out. They have these turkeys in the High Park Petting Zoo. He pauses and his eyes widen. That's totally not why I called you. We have business. Actual business. You are being recruited. Recruited? More like summoned by Eleanor. Who's Eleanor? She'll explain. When you meet her, you just have to keep this on the down low. I sit there wondering what the actual fuck I've gotten myself into. He takes my phone from my hand and puts his number in my contacts. And I'm like, how can you still have a phone if you're pretending to be dead? He says it's under Eleanor's name. We walk through Chinatown and up Spadina until we get to Palmerston. Lionel grabs my wrist and leads me to one of those old discolored townhouses with the scraggly front gates that normal people can't really afford. We take the back door. An orange cat blocks our path and half gurgles, half meows. Lionel quietly meows back. A woman sits cross-legged on top of the kitchen counter with a joint in one hand and a copy of The Economist in the other. Smoke slips through her dark hair. I'd give Ruth Bader Ginsburg my fucking kidney, she says, taking a hit. I'm doing everything in my power to ensure that that woman lives till she's 240 fucking years old. She can take my bone marrow. Just fucking take it. She looks up from her paper and motions towards me. This your journalist? I don't know if I'd go that far, I say. Lionel introduces us. Eleanor looks unfazed. Are they game or not? I haven't, um, Lionel stumbles. I didn't really explain. I thought, I thought thought that maybe you could be the one to ask. Ask me what? I interrupt. Communications. Eleanor flicks her joint into the sink and jumps off the kitchen counter. We need someone to relay messages to our contact in the opposing party. Old school style. You up for that? I blink at her. Hard. She turns to Lionel. You literally didn't tell them a single thing. Lionel glances around awkwardly. Eleanor sighs and starts to tell me what her deal is. She met Lionel about a year and a half ago in Trinity Bellwoods Park while he was running a secret little after-school music program for city kids. He was braiding each kid a dandelion flower crown, and she was leaning up against a pine tree with a switchblade in her hand, trying to decide whether or not she was going to end him. A sloppy and impulsive revenge plot against the mayor. She was ready. She'd made peace with her decision. And then... He was... Lionel... He was giving the kids an interactive lesson on treating ants with respect, and he bought them each a water bottle with their name written on it in cursive. He was sunshine incarnate, and she couldn't do it. 
She caught up with him after and was basically like, hi, your dad's a fucking demon. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I know. And they like bonded over their mutual hatred. They went back to her house and drank too much boxed wine and decided to dedicate their lives to the fall of Richard Scobie. For a while, their arrangement worked something like this. Eleanor got contacts in big press and in the opposing political parties. Lionel worked as an informant, gathering info from his father's files and through various conversations with his colleagues. He would send info to Eleanor, who would then send info to the parties, who then sent info to the star. Then, at the beginning of December, Lionel goes to Eleanor and is like, he knows there's a mole, but he doesn't know who it is. And the whole operation is about to come crashing down until Eleanor's like, you have to disappear. And Lionel's like, my passport is expired. And Eleanor's like, you have to disappear from the face of the fucking earth. He told his housekeeper Matilda the plan. No one else. They did it while Richard was out of town. Lionel wrote the letter, took his father's hunting rifle, and after Matilda made the call that Lionel had killed himself, everything started to move in slow motion. They paid off a cop to say that he was on the scene when they found the body. Lionel didn't leave Matilda's apartment. Richard only came back into the city on the day of the funeral, spreading ashes that probably weren't even human, let alone his sons. Lionel Scobie's death was a necessary distraction. He leaves the kitchen to go and chase the cat, whose name is Chester the Destroyer. Eleanor narrows her eyes at me like she's reading a book, but she can think of a better metaphor than the author can. What? I ask. She says nothing, just continues to look at me. She doesn't like me. I mean, she doesn't have any reason to. She doesn't know me. I'm fascinated by her, but I wouldn't say that I like her. Not yet, anyway. I feel like Lionel is the type of person who likes people immediately, without any thought given to whether or not they're going to fuck him over. It's like he's missing a key method of defense that people use to vet one another. He loves blindly, like he's always in a trust fall, but he's so relaxed that he's sleeping. These obituaries, Eleanor starts. We need you to put messages in them. Your paper's a dud. It's the perfect way for my contacts and I to talk to one another. I ask her if I can have time to think about it. It's not just a lose my job scenario. It's a lose my life type of deal. She starts to go over the specifics, but her voice fades out into white noise. Claire is standing in the hallway of the house. Her soaking feet leave wet prints in the cream carpet. Tufts of snow knot her curly dark hair. She usually leaves if I ignore her, but today she's lingering in plain sight. A droplet of blood spills down from her temple and under her cheek. She moves her hand to wipe it, but smears the blood across her face. Fuck, I scared you straight, Eleanor says. If this is too much, I'm fine, I say. But Claire is still there. And I can't stop thinking about all the paper root money I spent on white roses from city flowers and the taste of snow and what it sounds like when someone's skull... Lionel comes up behind me and I jump. So, are you joining the war effort? Eleanor watches me carefully. I nod my head, but we can both sense my lack of surety. I walk Lionel back to Matilda's apartment. I wasn't intending on explaining the ghost thing to him at all. Like, ever. But we're lounging on the velvet couches, drinking chocolate-flavored coconut water, and I suddenly blurt out, your mom says Paris has the USB, without even processing it through my brain first. Lionel stares at me, and I sigh and go, I can, um, like, talk to ghosts sometimes. And I expect him to laugh or get mad or ask me to leave, but instead he just nods and says, okay, over and over. I'm all like, I'm super fucking sorry, and I'm going to go now. And he goes, did she say anything else? She didn't. And I didn't want to bullshit him by giving him a good old scripted follow your dreams speech. She said, Paris has the USB and she left. Ghosts are pretty goal oriented. They usually don't stick around for longer than they have to. I ask him what it means. Paris is uh, my brother, he says. The USB is my father's. It's got work stuff on it. We think. We've been trying to find out. I nod and grab my coat. He walks me to the front door, which is like awkward and unnecessary. Do you want to, um, coffee? Again? On Tuesday? He says. To talk about what I'm putting in the paper? He pauses. Yeah, yes, for sure yes. Business coffee. I'm all business. The rational part of my brain is like, don't go on a date with a dead kid. And my mouth is like, see you then. The thing about ghosts is that they always say what they mean. They have no reason not to. No stakes. Living people don't do that. 
We say everything except for what we mean. Then we sit around praying to a deity we can't see that the people we talk to can interpret us correctly, but also praying that they don't interpret us correctly because we have no fucking idea what we actually want. I know that I think I know what I want. I think that I want to help Eleanor overthrow patriarchy on a municipal level. I think I want Honey to stop asking when I'm getting the surgery. I think I want Lionel. No, like, I mean, I want to get to know Lionel. Like, I want to get to know him. Like, as a colleague. I also, like, want to wear his sweater. And sometimes I think about his hair and it makes me happy. And dandelions looked so stupid before and now I see them everywhere. Like, that shade of yellow is on everything and I can smell it in food and feel it on fabric. And it's got this sound like a finality, like a car door clicking closed after slamming it for years. Like, I didn't even have a favorite flower before he said his, but now I want to blow him away and make a wish. I want to ruin him. Like how I ruined Claire. Lionel calls me at 11.53 p.m. and I don't answer. He doesn't deserve to be ruined. Today is Sunday, December 17th, 2017. And my life's about to either get exhilarating or fucking harrowing. Reminder, you'll definitely need better shoes. Memoriam is written and produced by Sydney Bruman. All of our available episodes can be found on the Apple Podcasting app and on iTunes, as well as on memoriampodcast.squarespace.com. 